Welcome everyone. Today is a special episode of Housing Wire Daily where I wanted to remember and celebrate a titan in our industry, Dave Stevens. Dave passed away several weeks ago after a long bout with cancer, and I wanted to bring on three of his colleagues to talk about what they remembered most about him and to share some stories the rest of us might not know. First, I wanted to recap his incredible career in mortgage. Dave became a loan officer in 1983 in Colorado, working for 16 years at World Savings. He left for Freddie Mac in 1995, where he was senior vice president of single family lending and led product development credit risk, and contract negotiations for all single-family businesses. Following stints at Wells Fargo and Long & Foster companies, in 2009, President Obama appointed Dave to serve as Assistant Secretary of Housing and Federal Housing Commissioner for HUD. He oversaw FHA programs for single and multifamily housing for two years, and then he left government service and became President of the Mortgage Bankers Association. Most recently, he was the CEO of Mountain Lake Consulting, a financial services consulting firm focused on real estate finance. His colleagues and my guests today are Bill Emerson, President and CEO of Rocket Companies, Rob Van Raphorst, Senior Vice President at Rational 360, and Marcia Davies, COO and founder of Empower at the Mortgage Bankers Association. Bill, thanks so much for being on the podcast today. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Great to have you. So, you know, my first question is, how did you know Dave Stevens? How did I know Dave Stevens? The first time I ever met Dave Stevens was at a closed industry event. Uh, he was the head of FHA at the time, giving a presentation on all things FHA to a bunch of executives. And I remember uh, being in that room and asking him a question that I thought was a very logical question to ask and him looking at, looking at me and saying, I'm sorry, I can't answer that question. That was literally the first time I ever met Dave Stevens. But Uh, I really got to know Dave, more importantly, um, when he was running the NBA and I was on the leadership ladder. I got to spend a lot of time with him there. What was it like to work with him? Oh, (laughs) well, um, Mr. Stevens was a fun dude to hang out with. Um, You know, he's actually a very interesting mix of understanding the business. He was a practitioner back in the day. Um, Like to talk about the fact that he was a loan officer. I still am not sure if he ever actually sold a loan but he talked about it a lot. Um, But he also had a unique ability to understand policy and interact with policymakers. And I think he was the right guy at the right time for the NBA because he was confident. Um, He always had an opinion. He was willing to share it. He stood up for the industry. Um, And frankly, at the end of the day, he was a fun guy to interact with and work with because, um, you know, most of the time he didn't take himself too seriously. I love that. What do you think he would want to be remembered for? Did you guys ever talk about that? Did he did he talk about a legacy? You know, he never did. Um, Dave doesn't didn't seem to be that kind of guy to me. Um, I think he did what he did because he wanted to do it. Um, you know, I'm sure he would like to be remembered fondly, and I think anybody that ever interacted with him would remember him fondly um, for some of the things that I described. But you know, even more so, uh, just Dave as a human being, as a family man, as as um, you know the way he operated. And by the way. Maybe the most perfect head of hair I have ever seen on a living human in my life. That may be his legacy. <laughs> and he might really think that that was a great legacy. That's hard. That's hard to achieve. <laughs> it's not well. Take it from one who has no hair. Yes, it is very hard to achieve. I would agree. Where do you think he had his biggest impact? So you worked with him at um, at NBA, but you saw him in a lot of different you know uh, places that he worked. Like, where do you think he had the greatest impact? Yeah, I mean, that's a tough question because he had such a long career. Um, You know, I actually think he was great inside of FHA uh, for the same reasons that he was great um, at the NBA, because he did understand the business. He was able to bring business acumen to the FHA. He was able to get FHA to think differently about some of the things that they were working on, which is anybody that's been in the industry knows sometimes it's hard to get FHA to think differently about their business. Um, But, you know, I mean, at at the end of the day, um, Dave... I, I think Dave really had the biggest impact in my time frame as the leader of the NBA, as a, a very, very strong voice uh, for the industry, regardless of what part of the industry you came from. He cared deeply about it, and it showed every single time he presented anywhere um, at any stage he was ever on. I love that. Is there a story you have about Dave that makes you laugh when you think about it? Probably th- hundreds of them. The one, the one that sticks in my mind most is... Uh, 
the Midwinter Conference, which Dave still likes to call his his conference because it was an NBA conference and then it wasn't an NBA conference, and I think he and Marsha brought it back. We'd have a dinner every year uh, that Kurt Fotenauer from First American would put on, and, and uh, invariably some of us would choose to sing along with the uh, guitar player. And I think there's a, a, a captured video of Dave and I doing um, – Thunder Road from Bruce Springsteen that will probably always stick in the back of my mind. Wow. Is there video of that? Is is that something we could get a hold of? Oh, Marcia's uh, in yes. I've, I've been trying to get it burned for years, but there, you know, it might be out there somewhere. I just, I, I can't put my hands on it. Thank God. What, what do you wish, what do you people not know about Dave that you wish they did that you, you hope that they see that side of him? Wow. That's a great question. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, there's so many people that Dave knows, and he was a pretty open, transparent guy. Uh, so I think you got a pretty good sense of him when you talk to him. But I will say he was a massive music lover um, and uh, always enjoyed that about him and, and, you know, being able to let his hair down and have a little fun with music wherever we were at. I love that. What will you remember most about Dave? You know, I, I think when you just st- step back and boil it all down, I, I will always think of Dave as a father, a husband and someone who cared deeply about the people around him, uh, the industry that he worked in and worked for. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if you can ask for more than that from um, a, a life well lived. So I'm going to go over now. Uh, Rob, I'm going to go to you first, and then Marsha will end with you. You know, my first question is, how did you know Dave Stevens? I first got to know Dave in, uh, around 2013 when I started working at MBA. And I had never, I had never worked for somebody before who was so, I think Bill said it was so transparent about who he was and that, that sort of transparency, uh, came through whether he was talking to people that he worked with, whether he talking to his family or whether he was talking to people he didn't know, he was always the same person. And he just, he didn't have this need to guard himself. Uh, in a way that that made him and, and show just a little bit of himself. I think he wanted to show who he was at all times to everyone, uh, and it really it was really eye opening and sort of refreshing to be around somebody like that. I think it was such um, one of the things about his personality that was so winning is that you felt like you. I mean, here is a very powerful person. Here is somebody who you know, was influencing policy and influencing advocacy, and yet. He would, he would just be, I mean, he would talk to anyone. We had, we had new reporters that would call him up. He would uh, be so generous with his time. And, and it just felt like he was a real person. Yeah. He would often call me after he talked to the reporter and say, Hey, I just talked to this reporter, make sure I didn't say anything that I shouldn't have. Um, but you know, Dave, Dave, I think of three things when I, when I think of Dave in terms of work, I think the first thing I think about is he was not one to sit on his hands and wait for something to happen or plan for something to happen. He did it. And it really inspired me to, every time I, 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 to this day, think about, you know, waffle on something, he just did it. And he, and he, he didn't, he didn't, he cared if it, you know, went well, but he was so uh, willing to sort of take a risk or to push himself out there uh, that it really resonated with me that you can't just sit and wait for things to happen. You have to make them happen and you have to have the confidence to make them happen. I think that was one. I think two, he was constantly politicking whatever he cared about. He was on the phone with him. He was emailing, he was texting. And even if something wasn't happening, he was like willing it to happen. I just remember thinking that at all times, he's like willing whatever he cares about to happen. And uh, so that's something I brought away. And then the third is he was really good at advocating for himself in a way that made him, that made people want him. And, you know, a lot of people always tell you, well, you need to stand up for yourself. You need to, you need to really, you know, take control of these meetings and stuff. Dave's approach was a little different. He knew how to get people who were interested in him to always stay interested in them in him and sort of keep them on their, on their back heels a little bit and, and, and make them wonder, you know, is this guy, is, is he gonna be around? Is he gonna, am I gonna still be able to work with this guy? And, you know, I, I saw that at MBA. I saw that when I worked with him after MBA and it's, uh, it was just a good, re- it was just an interesting way to see somebody sort of conduct themselves in a, in a world and in a, in, in the business world where, where, where it's so brutal and so cutthroat that you're constantly having to fight for your turf. You know, if you can define that turf and and make people come to you and make them sort of wonder about you all the time, 
uh, I thought it was a really unique uh, skill set that he had. Where do you think he got that confidence from? Did he ever talk about it? Like, like it, was he just one of those people born confident or, you know, what was it in his background that is like m brought that confidence to wherever he, whatever he was doing? Well, I would say I, my guess is like all good salespeople, you know, they get a rush out of the cell. So uh, I think it probably started with that. I think he was a, he learned young that he was a good sales guy and he always seemed to be selling something and he was always sort of looking for that rush. And I, I think if you are like, I went back to, I was talking about politics and you're always sort of, you know, reviewing what you're doing and reviewing how you're presenting yourself to make the sale. So I think the confidence came in his ability to sort of say, if I'm going to make this sale, whatever it may be, whether it's a house, whether it's bringing in a new member, whether it's bringing in a new client, whether it's convincing a member of Congress to do something, uh, I really have to put a thought in my presentation and how I'm being perceived. And so I think that over time, that confidence just built up in him, the more he thought about his presentation to everybody. What is a funny story that you have about Dave? It's funny, I was texting Marsha earlier today, one, one in particular, uh, you know, I used to travel with Dave a lot. And when you travel with somebody, you really get to know them on an intimate, in an intimate way, you really understand their rhythms. And D Dave was always, Dave's wife was always really concerned about what he was eating on the road. And Dave was always eating, you know, horribly. And, and he would, I remember he would, this one time he, we were like eating con, we were eating hot dogs in some, in some train station. And he was like negotiating this, like this deal on the phone while he's eating it. And he gets this call from his wife and she, she, and all I hear is, honey, it's not me. I'm fine. I'm fine. Rob made me buy the hot dog. And then he, uh, and then he it winked at me with this and, and had this big Cheshire cat grin come over his, his face. Uh, and so I never thought, I never forgot that. Cause there's always a wink and a nod with him. That's a great story. Yeah. Well, there was, a, there was another, there was another time we were, we were riding on a train up to New York and, um, the, the person came down the aisle and was, 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 uh, was asking if anybody wanted to eat anything. And he said, I'll get a hot dog and a glass of wine. And he said, uh, he said, Rob, do you want a, do you want a Coke or something? And uh, I was like 37 at this time. And I remember texting Marsha, you know, I'm over 21. I, I hope NBA has that in their records. <laughs> You're like, I could have a glass of wine and be okay. Right, know? right. Oh my gosh. Well, seeing him in all those different, you know, um, all, all the different places you travel, what he did, what do you think, where, where do you think he had the biggest impact from your perspective? I think on his family. I think they really, um, he was always, he was, a, like Bill said, he was a, it was a great family man and he was always uh, really concerned with what they were doing. And, you know, he told me when my kids, I remember my kids were really young and I was, I was so tired from staying up with them. And he just said, you know, in life, when your kids are little, everything's physical. As they get older, it's, it's going to all be mental. So just remember that and enjoy these moments. And uh, I think about that today as my kids are older and it's all mental now. So uh, it was a really, it was a really great life lesson. And he just sort of said it offhand. And I, th I think to have that in his back, uh, back of his mind in, in a moment like that really meant a lot to me. It's so interesting to me in, um, that he was one of the first uh, male leaders I saw in industry who really was so upfront about his commitment to his family and, um, you know, was just unapologetic about it, something everybody knew about him. And I think that was just such a great role model for everyone, right? So like we can all be like, we're, we're all people first, we all have families. And um, I just, I was always so impressed with that. It never took away from all the other impressive things he did that he was also very dedicated to his family. Yeah, there's no question about it. And especially I think in, a, in an industry where you're, you're working so many hours um, and you're with, with, with your work people so, so often to be able to, to always go back to them was really impressive. What do people not know about Dave that you wish they did? Dave used to brag about not wearing expensive suits. That's what I remember about him. And he used to tell me the key to, to, to looking good is not wearing an expensive suit. It's, it's not ever rolling up your sleeves or undoing your tie and, and always wear a suit to the office. That's, that's something I, uh, I <laughs> that was always something I remembered, especially when people in our industry would wear expensive suits around them. No, that's interesting. And I mean, obviously, you know, he, he was around those people all the time. I mean, he was in the halls of power. He was, you know, one of the power brokers. So it's interesting that he was like, I don't need a suit. I don't need an expensive suit. It's what's in the suit, right? Well, as long as it was pressed and he looked crisp, that's all that mattered. <laughs> 
What will you remember most about him? Listen, he did a lot for me, uh, for, for my, for my career. I mean, I, I worked for him for, for, for a lot of years and, uh, at NBA and afterwards. And so I, I think I'll always remember what he was able to do. I mean, I was able to really buy my first house because of him and, and continue to sort of grow in my career because of him. So I'll, I'll be forever grateful for all of that. That's so great. Thank you for sharing that. I really appreciate it. And, and Marsha, now we go to you and you and Dave worked with each other across, you know, different organizations, doing different things, worked really closely. What, tell us how you met him. I met Dave over 20 years ago when he joined Freddie Mac. I had been at Freddie Mac for, oh gosh, 15 years by the time he had joined Freddie Mac. And um, one of our first meetings, I was in servicing at the time and he was in sales. So one of our first meeting was about the organization was going to come together and reorg, and we had to work together on what that new organization was going to look like. So we kind of got thrown into a conference room together to um, figure out the future of how we were going to work together. That That is big. So, you know, when he, you guys both moved on from Freddie Mac, but let's talk about Freddie Mac for a minute. What do you think his biggest impact was there? Oh, gosh. Dave um, taught a lot of people at Freddie Mac, the importance of the customer, no matter how big or how small. We always had a great sales team, but Dave came in and he came in with um, Pat Sheehy and Sabre Salam and um, they all came in at the same time and they really restructured how the sales department worked, what needed to go into supporting the sales department and um, made it, uh, it was always a priority, but really in only a fashion that Dave could, he would walk the halls, he would see the CEO, he would make sure people knew who he was and knew what his issues were. And um, he worked well internally. He was a great colleague, whether it was with pricing or credit or any of the other departments, he would make sure he had those relationships and those close relationships so that he could get his job done. That's so great. How do you, you know, seeing him work across so many years, like how did he keep up that energy level? Like, it seems to me like there was a huge energy level though. And also, especially when you're dealing with people and when you're sell selling, right. And you're basically selling all the time. Well, it's interesting when Dave took the job as FHA commissioner, I think people were surprised because a lot of people who knew Dave knew him from Freddie Mac or his time at Long and Foster, where he was running sales and sales organizations, um, big sales organizations. So to go into the public policy world and during the you know, financial crisis, I think people were surprised that Dave stepped up to take that job. And it was his wife, and he would say this um, to anybody who asked, who convinced him to take the job because she knew that side of Dave that the industry may not have um, met yet, which was his political side, his advocacy side, wanting to solve the big problems. And so I believe that his time at HUD, he got to show a whole different side of himself. So yes, he's an amazing salesperson and that goes into advocacy and how you get your point across and how you get people to want to follow the direction you're going in. And um, it just raised his profile in the platform of who he was for the industry. And um, I really believe he came from that position of FHA commissioner. And when he left HUD and came to MBA, he was viewed very differently. He wasn't known when he came to MBA for his sales skills. He was known for his policy skills and the way he could navigate Capitol Hill, bring, you know, he brought an advocacy advocacy coalition for housing together under MBA that has um, really been one of his big legacies is making MBA the powerhouse that it is today is because of the way he led when he came in. And um, we used to we used to say when Dave came to MBA, it didn't have strong mojo. When Dave was at MBA and after Dave left, MBA's mojo is strong and it's because of his leadership. What did he enjoy most about working at MBA? Oh, he, well, there's, he loved a lot. First of all, he loved the people here at MBA. Um, we're not that big of an organization. So 
we talk about what a great family man it, Dave was, and he treated everybody at MBA like family. He knew everybody's name. He would walk the halls. He would get to um, you know their job and understand what their contribution to the organization was. But Dave loved politics. He loved to meet with regulators and talk about, he was a great, what I call dot connector. He could connect the dots on the most complicated subject, whether it's to a member of Congress or head of a regulatory body to make them understand what consequences intended or unintended would be to the consumer and what that meant for communities in this you know, country and what it would mean for families. And I used to say to him, you're so good at boiling things down so that we all can understand what's going on and the impact that this you know, policy change or this bill is going to have on the nation's communities. Speaking of impact, what do you, where do you think um, for you personally, what impact did he have on your career or your life? Oh, gosh. Um, One, I would have probably never gone into public service. So um, when Dave called and asked me to join him at HUD, um, originally I said no. And he would call back. And uh, anybody who knows Dave, if he gives you the answer he doesn't want to hear, he's going to keep calling. And um, I ended up going to HUD. He told me the president needed me. By the way, I never did meet the president, but apparently he needed me. But anyway, he um, convinced me to uh, join him at HUD. And it was one of the best career moves I ever made. I didn't know it at the time, but that job prepared me so well for the job I have today at MBA. And um, I owe it to him. And when I came into MBA and we started to um, make our impact here, Dave would continue to give me more responsibility and help him um, make sure this organization was strong and functioning well. So um, he really did do a lot for my career. I love that. Um, You know, do you want to share a story? Uh, Do you have a story about Dave that uh, makes you laugh? I have several, but um, I will... I will tell this one, which he would be, you know, he might haunt me for telling this one, but when we were working together at Freddie Mac, we were under the same senior vice president at the time, um, or maybe an executive vice president, because I think Dave was a senior vice president at the time, and we were doing a strategic planning session, and Dave and I were disagreeing about something, and um, apparently we were being disruptive, and um, us disagreeing with each other. And it was um, throwing the schedule of the strategic planning meeting off because Dave and I kept arguing that um, we actually were asked to leave the session and go into the stairwell and fight it out and then come back when we could get along. And we were friends ever since that time. So um, we learned how to disagree and how two stubborn people can um, share their points of view and come to you know, a conclusion that was for the better good of the organization. How do you think Dave would want to be remembered? Did, did he ever talk about that with you or, or, or just in your own mind, do you think this is what was really important to him? As a father and a husband, I know um, Rob and Bill have said this already, but Dave was a family man first. And I will tell you, he did work 24 seven, right? You never knew when Dave slept. Um, He seemed to be able to text you at, you know, 1230 at night and again at five in the morning. And he was still present for his family. And he was able to multitask and stay connected in a way, not only to us in the industry, but as I think Rob mentioned earlier, He would take calls from his family during the day. He would handle situations that were coming up um, or scheduling vacations, whatever it could be. He he did it all and um, he did it seamlessly and he, he was happy to do it. I think that's, you know, with Dave, even if there was a footfall, he would laugh and say, well, I guess we can't do that again or learn from it. And, um, He never took himself too seriously. And I think that really made people gravitate to him because he had 
such an influence over so many things in our industry. But um, he was just down to earth, normal, fun guy. What will you miss most about him? His laugh when he did something that he knew he shouldn't have done. Like 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 a kid in trouble? Well, no, he would know he didn't follow his own. Like he would talk to a reporter and then call the public affairs department to say, by the way, and then he would giggle and then say, oh, I talked to Sarah Wheeler today because he knew Rob would be annoyed that he didn't tell Rob ahead of time so Rob could do his job. And so, um, but he had a a distinctive giggle when he knew he did something that um, you were going to not like, I guess is the best way to say it, or may disagree with. You know the best part about that story? That's how he laughed most of the time because that's how he behaved most of the time. He enjoyed doing it that. It is true. Yeah. I love that, Bill. So from your perspective, it's like, you know, he he was one of those people who's like, he's going to do it and then ask for forgiveness after? He didn't even ask for forgiveness. He just did it. He would chuckle. He would smile. He would move on. Maybe he'd learn from it. Maybe he wouldn't. But it didn't. it wouldn't really change it the next time. I mean, you know, it was all typically in good fun, but, um, but yeah, he, he, that was, that was more of his laugh most of the time. Tell me I'm wrong, Marcia. No, it's 100%. And, you know, I, I have always been, um, you know, a lot of times people have to go up and testify and they're, you know, rightfully so nervous or anxious about it. Dave would come in whistling and, the team that would go up to the hill with him would be all like, you know, getting all the materials together. He's like, come on guys, let's go. I'm ready. He loved to testify. I said, Dave, you're the only person on the planet I know who loves to testify. He goes, who knows more than what I know about the topic they're going to address. So he was not intimidated at all because he had that confidence that we talked about earlier. Just he knew he was advocating for the right reasons and to help communities across, you know, the country. And he looked forward to having um, the opportunity to talk about it on Capitol Hill. It makes me laugh because just recently you sent me the picture uh, of Dave on Capitol Hill laughing and he goes, who else would laugh during a testimony? And I texted Marsha back and go, interesting. I happen to be in a deposition myself right now. That is not usually a, a, a circumstance where people, you know, find humor or enjoyment. So it's amazing to me that, you know, but it also speaks to why he was so effective, right? He had the confidence and also like, I mean, he, he, he knew what he was advocating for. And he trusted his instincts. I think he really had great instincts. He saw things before others may not have um, been able to see them. And I also think he saw things in people that they didn't see in themselves. And so I think he had a real gift for surrounding himself with people who would um, enhance his effectiveness. He didn't want a lot of people just like him. He wanted people who could, you know, supplement his strengths, but take care of the things where he either wasn't interested in or, um, didn't want to be bogged down with. And so I just think he had a great, um, a great way of surrounding himself with really, really good people who would support him and help move his agenda forward. I, I think to that point, the one thread between really between Bill, Marsha and, and Dave is that, that, you know, they would never, they're always leaning forward so much in, in, in uh, trying to get, to what they're trying to do, their mission, whatever it may be, that they're not going to let their own hangups get in the way of that or their own ego or anything like that. I mean, I think it's more important. It was more important to him. And I can, I think, speak for the both of you, having worked with you both, that you get whatever job you're trying to get done. That's what's the most important thing. And having that attitude and being around people like that. And when you get several people thinking like that, in the same way, I mean, watch out. It's a, it's a very powerful weapon. Well, uh, one story, and Bill, I was going to remind you of, I'm sorry, I've got a fire truck coming um, by my office. But when we were trying to convince Bill to join um, the leadership ladder at MBA, and you know, you start with, you start with some good wine and a good meal, and then you let Dave go in for the kill. 
Do you remember it the same way? Well, it was a it was a process because I was first approached by Deb Still and I laughed and just kept walking and you know again and again and conversations after conversations and um, you know I I don't recall that that particular conversation but it doesn't surprise me one bit um, knowing Dave and the way that he operated. The interesting flip side of that is Dave, as you said, Rob, Dave would always leave, leave you feeling like maybe you weren't going to see him again, or maybe he wasn't going to be there. And literally we're at midwinter and he's uh, in his term and I'm, I'm the, uh, I'm the sitting chair of the MBA and Dave comes to me and he goes, I, I have to leave. I've got to leave the MBA. I've got to go do something else is typical negotiation tactics. So we all sat down around the table and figured out it, made sure that we were able to extend his, his stay at MBA during that particular conference. Um, it's just, just kind of the way Dave was. I love that. You know, I'd, I'd love to um, end with, you know, each of you telling me, like, is there something you'll take away as a leader that you learned from Dave, like a leadership lesson, or you're just like, you know, I, you know, something you want to say about leadership and Dave? I would say be authentic. Uh, it was very important to Dave to show up who he was, and he gave us all permission just to be who we were. And um, that was important to me. I love that. Rob, do you want to go next? You know, uh, he excelled. You know, don't don't let anyone question whether or not you're doing a good job. The second that starts to happen, you better you better act quickly and reinforce that that you know what you're doing and that you're uh, that you're that you're the one to be in charge. And I will always remember that. That's a great one. And Bill, we'll end with you. So I, I'm not sure um, if I would say learn. I think Dave and I were very similar in lots of ways. I mean. Um, Say what you mean, be candid, be authentic, be clear. Um, you know, Dave was a great presenter and, you know, you'd watch him stand on a stage and he would own that stage. And if you're really going to be a leader and you're going to impact more than one person in front of you, you have to be able to address a group. And I think that was something that he was just incredibly, incredibly good at. So as opposed to learning that you recognize that in, in someone else, right? The, the, the same thing that maybe you do. Yeah, it was, it was actually, it was fun because some, a lot of times it was validation and the things that were happening on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and let's face it, you know, folks that do what Dave did and, and what I do and what a lot of people do at senior levels, you don't have a whole lot of interaction or contact with others. And so when you see somebody doing something that you think you do as well, it's just great validation and, and it just, it makes it easier to go do it the next time. Well, I just want to say thank you so much to all three of you for sharing your memories of Dave, your insights, what you learned, his impact. Um, I know that, you know, he touched so many people in this industry and it's hard, you know, when we're all spread out to to feel like, oh yeah, I just I just want to hear somebody talk about him. I just want to, you know, get that insight. So thank you for being doing that today. Thank you for for carrying on something that I think he would be happy about. 